Hello, I'm A.D. Hobbs and um, I'm going to do a film review of the movie Jaws because it's 2015 and it's the 40th anniversary of the movie Jaws. Now what can I say about Jaws that hasn't been said already? Well, quite a lot actually, <laughs> there's, there's a lot to it. The movie made $150 million on its $8 million budget, so that's a serious profit. When 150 million is a heck of a lot now, much less back in 1975. You know, it was phenomenal, and and the only film that topped it was Star Wars. You know, and um, and anyway, let's get to the point. Um, Jaws was not the first mo Jaws movie I saw. I saw Jaws three when I was about seven. Well, I say saw it. I didn't really see it. No, I saw like the last half hour of it, but I I got the gist of it. You know, this killer shark that wreaks havoc. Now, I saw Jaws a few months later, so I was still seven, and um, it was at Christmas time, like a few days before Christmas Day, and I'd heard a lot about Jaws, you know, I knew that, that theme tune I'd heard, the dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun-dun, yes, I was very familiar with that, it had been used in a lot of TV shows and films, because everyone's so familiar with something scary coming, they play that, and um, and also... In uh, in England, I don't know if they have this in other countries, but in England they, there's a popular crisp called Monster Munch. And I remember when I was seven years old, there was another crisp that was Jaws. It, it was like a pun on Monster Munch, except instead of shaped like, like monster's teeth, it was shaped like shark's teeth. It was crisps shaped like shark's teeth. And it was crisps that was merchandising for Jaws. So, so yes, yes, Jaws was everywhere. It was in the air. And I didn't fully understand why... And Jaws was a big deal in 1987, but looking back, I think I know why now, because Jaws 4 had just been released. So that, that's why. And that's why Jaws movies are being shown on TV, to get people in the mood for Jaws. And I remember, even before I'd seen any Jaws films, I remember all these kids talking about Jaws 2, and every, all of them going on and on about it. They talked about nothing else for the whole day, and I was like, right, okay, this, this franchise is a big deal, yeah. Okay, so start at the beginning. The movie Jaws, I was, yes, blown away by. I'd never seen anything like it. It's a horror film. It's an aquatic thriller. It's, um, it, there are some comic elements in it. But for me, it's also like an action-adventure film as well. It's like a roller coaster ride. So it's like all the best elements of different films put together in one movie. So it's, it, it makes sense when you see it, yeah. And also, I suppose I better mention that um, the mechanical shark kept going wrong. And that's why, for the first half of the film, you don't see the mechanical shark. You just see, The director just suggests the shark, doesn't actually show it. So we just see a bit of a fin, or we see something destroyed, you know. But in a way, that works. It makes it more scary that you don't see it. What is it? What is this thing, you know? Because, yeah, um, you don't know what it looks like, you know. And then there's that scene when Sheriff Brody throws the bait in the over the boat and this massive mouth comes out of the water, you know, and it's, yeah, <laughs> he sees it up close and sees just how big it really is. But that, yeah, it's just so clever the way it works and it was a blessing in disguise because the original plan was to have, see lots of the shark throughout the film, but because, you know, it, the, the, the mechanical puppet kept going wrong, they, um, yeah, they, uh, it was a blessing in disguise. Not seeing the shark, suggesting it, made it more scary and mysterious. And I think Ridley Scott took heed of this when he made the movie Alien. He, he, we don't see the creature clearly until when it's near the end of the film. Anyway, um, yeah, I'll say some trivia about the, the mechanical shark. Ha I thought, I assumed when I was a boy, they had a couple of divers with breathing apparatus uh, pulling the shark along and swimming side by side. And that's how it moves along. I thought, no, that's not how it's done. What they do is they have like a small railway line at the bottom of the sea. And they have like a big uh, metal crane attached to it going up. And the other bit of the crane attached to the belly of the puppet shark, pulling it along like that. That's how they do it. Which makes sense, because its belly is never in shot. So, yeah, that's fine. However, there were bits when you did need to see the belly, when it swims past you. Well, Steven Spielberg found the answer to that. You have footage of a real great white shark swimming past, but the way they edit it, you think a real shark and the puppet are one and the same. Whereas, of course, they're not, you know. And when I was seven, yes, I first saw Jaws, and it was one of those films everybody liked. You know, my elder sister liked it, my mum and dad watched it with me. Yeah, it was. everyone was gripped by it, you know. 
I do remember some bits that were too scary for my sort of dad to wear like that and all got to look like that. Because this was a new thing. I'd never seen a horror film. Okay, it's only a PG, but it was pretty scary stuff, yeah. And also, George reminded me a bit of King Kong. You know, I mean, it's a totally different story, but this is how it reminded me. It reminded me because um, uh, you're frightened of the monster, but at, this, at the same time you admire him, you know, because nothing can stop him, you know. And it's and it leaves you guessing to the end. How on earth are they going to kill this monster? You know, all these things they try, you know. And, um, oh, I suppose I better mention the, the, the book. Um, is my visual aid, the book Jaws. This is not the original from the 70s. This is the 30th anniversary edition, you know. I did have the original at one point, but sold it for, for a very small price. That was a very stupid thing to do. Anyway, um, here we go. That's the shark there, yeah. And it says it's never safe to go back in the water. It doesn't say that on the original book. No, it says, oh, man against beast in a town that won't face the truth or something like that. But I think the writing on the back is that's more or less the same. Pick up jaws, blah, 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 blah. And um, is it a good book? You know, well, I've read the book and all I can say is, um, yes, it is quite a good book. It is gripping. It is lots of um, very visual, visually descriptive. But the problem is there's too many subplots. Now, every great story should have subplots, yes, but there's just too many. There's so many subplots that we're sliding off the point. I forgot I was even reading a, a story about a shark, and then suddenly, yes, you are still reading a story about a shark. So it's really rather silly in that respect, you know. And also, of course, yes, one of the characters is having an affair with Sheriff Brody's wife, and Steven Spielberg didn't like that. I thought, no, no, no domestic squabbling. No, just get to the point. The main focus is the monster, the shark, you know. And I think the movie worked out better. All the attention is on this shark problem. How are we going to get rid of it, you know? And just domestic stuff is just distracting and silly, you know? And, um, oh yes, when I first read the book, this is going back a bit now, about ten years ago, I, um, I thought the shark didn't die at the end. We don't see it blown to bits like in the film. Smile, you son of a bitch, blown to bits. No, I thought it was still alive at the end. Then... A, a bloke I know, he, he said, um, no, the shark dies at the end. And if you read the, the last bit of writing, it says something like, Sheriff Brody was terrified, it's killed Hooper and it's killed Quint, and now it's going to kill him, it's coming within an inch of him, then it sinks in the water and drifts away. Well, that doesn't necessarily mean it's dead, does it? You know, <laughs> that's, that's very vague, you know, the lead character in the story, the shark, is he dead or not? Apparently he is. But the writer didn't clearly specify very well. Which I don't like it when writers do that. When it's a very important turning point in the story, I is the lead character dead or not, you should be very specific. But he isn't. He just says the shark drifts away, sinks to the water and drifts away. If an animal sinks to the water, that doesn't necessarily mean it's dead. Certainly not if it's a fish, because they breathe underwater. So that's, that's very vague, you know. So I thought, I assumed, the shark doesn't die and Brody barely escapes with his life. He salvages the, the, those inflatable barrel things to swim away. But, well, each to their own, I guess. You know, some people would disagree with me and say, no, it's obvious the shark's dead in the book, but um, it wasn't that obvious to me, you know. And, OK, back to the film. Um, yes, a lot of people think it's Steven Spielberg's first big hit film. Some disagree, some say... No, he directed Duel, and some say that's not a film because that was a TV film, and he directed The Sugarland Express. Um, but, well, George was certainly his first major hit, you know. And as Steve, this is a quote from Steven Spielberg because it was so unbelievably successful, it gave me the freedom to make any kind of film I wanted. Which, yeah, that sums it up. And I'll never forget when I first saw it, um, when it had finished, I just. This amazing feeling over me, I, just, I was in a state of awe. Couldn't believe it was so good. It was such a brilliant story, you know. And um, it's it's very rare that happens, you know. A story is that good on that kind of scale. Why is it so good? Well, I suppose because it's like a disaster movie, which is the disaster movies were very big in the seventies, because you get to know the characters and you care about them, you know. If you, if it, if it's bad character development, you don't care what happens to them, but because you care about them, you feel like you can relate to them and everything. And of course, Sheriff Brody, his job is the safety of the people, and of course, it's more personal—the safety of his own son. His son is almost eaten by a shark in this film, you know. 
But, um, oh yes, in spite of my uh, stick I've been giving the book, I will say this, something that, that was made very clear in the book. Um, Amity Island, which doesn't exist, it's a made-up island for the, for, the, for the story. Amity Island, um, the people that live there don't make any money at all in the autumn or the winter or the spring. They make no, little or no money at all. All the money they make is in the summer. So they don't spend it all. No, they save it to look after it so, that they, so they can survive on it for the other seasons of the year. So they don't want to lose holiday trade. It's nothing to do with being greedy. It's being practical to have any money at all. If they lose holiday trade, they're doomed, you know. And Sheriff Brody says, no, 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 we've got to kill the shark, you know. We, we have to for the safety of the people. But at no point does anyone say to Sheriff Brody, uh, you're a policeman. You will never lose your job, you know, you've got job security, whereas the rest of us haven't. We need summer dollars, you know. So, um, I think the simple answer is kill the shark, but be discreet about it, you know, to kill it in the most discreet way possible, you know, you know, would they... No, when a shark kills somebody in front of loads of people, that's anything but discreet, you know. And, um, oh yeah, um, something a bit, uh... <laughs> bit creepy I'm gonna say well I'm talking about horror film a bit creepy when Quint dies at the end yes it's pretty horrific pretty horrible very memorable scene but I remember thinking afterwards better him than Hooper or Brody you know because because he wasn't a very nice person he wanted everything for himself so it's poetic justice that the shark just happened to kill him instead of one of the other characters we like better well, Quint is good at his job, a good shark hunter, but his methods are somewhat unorthodox. And, um, you know, he's, um, he, uh, he keeps saying it's my vessel, so we do everything my way, you know. But the others are like, well, we have some say as well, you know, chief of police, ocean expert, you know. But Quint is a bit, um, egotistical, that's the word I'm looking for, yeah. And he makes out he knows better than everybody else, you know. Whereas the others think, well, no, not all the time, you know. Okay, um, okay, one last thing I'll say about the Jaws film. Um, yes, the look of the Great White Shark frightened me a lot. You know, it's got this, the shape of its nose and its teeth and everything. It's like, it looks like that. It's got this permanent scowl on its face. He looks like he's angry all the time. And that is quite creepy if you're not familiar with a Great White Shark. Yeah, they look... Uh, permanently pissed off all of the time. It's pretty heavy shit for a seven-year-old, you know. <laughs> Scary stuff, you know. And then almost a year later, I looked a bit like the little boy in the film there when he's going like that, <laughs> pretending to be a shark. Well, anyway, back to the point. Um, I thought, I assumed, giant sharks are complete fiction, just made up for an entertaining story. And then, yeah, about a year later, I was watching a wildlife documentary... And there was this massive, you know, great white shark. And we got a good shot of its teeth and everything because it was eating this big piece of meat on the end of a rope attached to a big boat. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty cool animatronic shark. And my elder sister said, what are you talking about? That's a real shark. You really can get great white sharks. They do exist and you can really get them that big. And that, that was a big uh, turning point for me. What? They're real! Sharks that big that can eat people are real! Holy gee, that's... Oh, God. Then I understood the movie Jaws had a much deeper meaning. It wasn't just a fantasy. No, it was... That could really happen. Very unlikely, but it could happen. And great whites are capable of long journeys. So, yes, um... For me, Jaws, a lot of issues in it, but the main one is this. We like to think human beings are the dominant species on the planet. And we are, to a certain extent. But there are some animals that don't identify us as the dominant species, like lions, tigers, crocodiles, and sharks. Sharks don't identify us as dominant at all. They, they identify us as food, and you don't take orders from things you want to eat. So yes, they, they don't identify us at all as, as superior. And there was one tagline that summed it up completely. Um, in the movie Jaws, three men hunting a shark, expert uh, shark hunting boat, but after a time, the hunter becomes the hunted. Yeah. Okay, I'll be back for more. I'm going to review the sequels. But until then, take care.